tonight on It's a Miracle. When Shirley Armstead applied to adopt a young child, she had no way of knowing that 23 years later, the little girl would bring her a miraculous message. It? I was speechless. I didn't say anything. I was like... And... While moving a large bale of hay, Bob Peterson lost control of his tractor and was left pinned under a thousand pound weight. I knew I had to stop that tractor because it could easily tip over. Now, only a miracle could save his life. Then, Come on, honey. Donna McDonough was eight and a half months pregnant when she went into a premature labor. But before she could get to the hospital, she began delivery. She's coming out, she's coming out. Pull over, she's coming out. Something just came over me that this baby was not alive, and I didn't know how we were going to deal with it. But an angel was on the way. These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight, we're going to once again take a journey into unfamiliar territory, a place where logic and reason don't necessarily hold sway, a place where the improbable becomes possible, a place where miracles happen. Now, you've probably all heard the saying that blood is thicker than water. Well, our first story tests that theory in a very personal and emotional way, proving that in the world of miracles, sometimes water can turn into blood. How's the search going? It's going okay. Um, In 1976, Shirley Armstead was a happily married wife and mother of two sons. But Shirley had always dreamed of having a daughter. To ensure that she got one, Shirley decided to adopt. It's a little bit unusual. Originally from Louisiana, Shirley came from a Creole background and was looking for a mixed race child. My father is part Jewish and French. My mother is also French. That's why I wanted to have a daughter that would blend into our family. So it is a little bit difficult um, to find a child. Because Shirley's request was so specific, so the adoption agency was able to produce only one candidate, a three-year-old child named Dana. And I'd like to have you take a look at her, see if she might be someone. So it looks so much like my little boy. And she said, it's not. It's your little girl. It's the daughter that I have for you. And I was like, I can't believe it, because they look so much alike. The little girl lived in foster care 300 miles away from the Armstead's Los Angeles home. And as they arrived to meet her for the first time, they were filled with both apprehension and anticipation. Shirley had her heart set on adopting this child, but would the little girl be open and willing to accept them as her family? It didn't take long to learn the answer. Hi, I'm Derek. Shirley's oldest son, Derek, still remembers his first impressions. She was lovable. She had a big smile on her face. She looked very happy. For Shirley, the moment she knew that Dana was the daughter she'd always dreamed of came from a simple childlike question. She kind of won me over when she said, when we get to my new home, would you please buy me some shoes? And I thought, that's my girl. She likes to shop. That was it. The decision had been made, and four Armsteads would be returning on the long drive home to Los Angeles. It made a family. It was good to have this third child in my life to care for and to love. In the years that followed, it became clear that the Armstead family was where Dana belonged. She may not have been blood related, but in her heart and in the hearts of her parents and brothers, she was an Armstead. I think that's where the miracle started, that I was brought into a home and given a, you know, the love and the care that I needed. And then, in 1994, tragedy struck. Dana's older brother, Derek, was diagnosed with a fatal illness. I have a chronic kidney failure, come from hypertension, it's very deadly. You can die 
overnight, you can die in a week, you can die in six months. Drugs and dialysis would provide temporary relief, but what Derek really needed was a new kidney, and that could take years. I was afraid for his life because I knew that he needed a donor and that he was on a transplant list. And there's got to be thousands and thousands of people waiting on transplants. You know, what is the likelihood of him getting one? I was more afraid for my kids because they needed somebody to guide them through life, to show them what was right and what was wrong. And I wanted to be there for them. Throughout his ordeal, the Armsteads banded together, trying to bolster Derek's spirits while knowing that none of his blood relatives had tested positive as a kidney donor. Happy birthday, Derek! His mother put on a brave face, but inside, the thought of losing her son was unbearable. I felt like dying, myself. I felt like that's it. I just didn't want to deal with the reality. There was no talk outside about a possible donor. It was almost as if it was a shed case. In 1976, when Shirley Armstead decided to expand her family by adopting a three-year-old child named Dana, she had no way of knowing that 23 years later, she would face losing another child, her natural son, Derek. Derek desperately needed a kidney transplant, but none of his blood relatives had tested positive as a match. Time was running out, and even Derek had given up all hope. I got to the point where I got really, really depressed and I was ready to give up because I saw no hope. Dana was particularly concerned about her older brother. I'm going to get tested. What do you think about that? I think you're crazy. I don't think it's a good idea. Derek had always told her that because she was not a blood relative, the odds of being a match were a long shot, and she should save herself the trouble. But time was running out. Dana decided she had nothing to lose. Don't worry. You've been worrying too much. I just said, wouldn't that be funny if I was a match? And he goes, yeah, right. And that was it. It was left at that. And when she told me she was going to go down and be tested, I just really didn't think much of it. I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, go for it. And she did. The first step was blood screen testing for kidney compatibility. As I was going through the testing, I was hoping inside, oh, God, you know, I hope everything works out fine. I hope I can help him. Knowing that the odds of matching her stepbrother's kidneys were very slim, Dana turned to prayer. I would go home and I would say, Dear God, please help me to be able to help Derek. I don't feel that this is something Derek deserves or something that he brought upon himself. Please continue to bless me to be able to help him. After a battery of additional blood and tissue tests, Dana received the news she'd been praying for. First, I called my mom, and I said, you're not going to believe this. She said, what? It was a match. Can you believe it? I said, <laughs> I can donate a kidney to Derek. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I was speechless. I didn't say anything. I was like, I was choked up. I couldn't say anything. I am so happy. And she said, you have got to be kidding. And I could hear the joy in her voice, like you she know? was on the verge of tears. <laughs> and she said, now, isn't that ironic? that we would pick you 23 years ago out of a foster home and you would turn up to be the person that can save Derek's life. You're kidding, right? <laughs> when she told her brother, he also couldn't believe the news. And he laughed it off. I said, no, we are a match and I can give you a kidney, so don't chicken out now. My whole life changed because I saw a chance to give my kids a better life let them enjoy some of the things in life that I did when I was coming up. I just felt a whole lot of hope at that point. On March 31st, 1999, Derek and Dana checked into the UCLA Medical Center. Transplant day had finally arrived, and a camera crew from It's a Miracle was there to document it and speak with Dr. Alban Gritch. Both of them are relatively young and healthy, uh, and so their blood vessels and their tissues should be 
uh, in good condition, and um, I don't have any concerns that they will, you know, have problems with the operation at this time. As medical technicians prepared them for the operation, they were flooded with mixed emotions, but mostly relieved that the transplant was finally going forward. When I wake up, I'm a whole new person. He just asked me if I was sure that I wanted to still do this, that I could still check the chicken out. It's my last chance. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm staying. It's a go. Dana was first to go under the knife, and almost immediately there were complications. Her mother waited anxiously in the hall. I'm nervous right now. We've waited for so long for this to happen. This is it. My heart is going tick, 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 tick. I'm really anxious. I want it to be over. After nearly three hours and the removal of two ribs, the doctors were finally able to extract Dana's left kidney. Here's the kidney, and we're going to uh, take it next door. It's all ready to go. Kidney's here. Kidney's here. Shirley and the rest of the family waited nervously as the kidney was transplanted into Derek. Oh, I'm hoping that everything will work for both of them, for both of them, especially Derek. Yeah, because if it doesn't, we know what the end result will be. He will die. Four hours after the surgery began, the Armstead family were given the news they'd been waiting for. Everything went just fine with the both operations. They're both in the recovery room, and you'll be able to see them up there. It was a joyful moment for the Armstead family, who can only wonder at the remarkable sequence of events that gave Derek a new chance at life. I definitely believe it's a miracle. For some reason, my picture was the only one that was given to them. They chose me. I feel very strongly that there was a miracle that took place. When God put that little girl in my life 23 years ago, I had no other children to choose from, only that one. There wasn't a question, it was like, she's yours. Hi, I'm Derek, you must be Dana. I believe that she's my guardian angel, that she was sent here from God 23 years ago, and he made it possible that we were a match so that she could do this for me. It's been six months since Derek received his new kidney, and there have been some surprising developments. We thought you might be interested in learning how the miracle has continued. And so, joining us now live are Derek and Shirley Armstead. Hello there. Hi. Hi. How, how, are you, how are you all doing? It's fine. Good, thank you. So how are you feeling right now, Derek? Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I feel excellent, matter of fact. Well, good. Well, you're looking fine. How about Dana? Has she fully recovered? She's doing well. She's recovering. She's back to work, and everything is looking good for her. Well, that's, that's a happy ending. That's wonderful. Now, I know that something happened shortly after the surgery that was, was very disturbing. Would you mind sharing that with us? Yeah. Right after the surgery, I had a situation of what you call a kidney rejection. And what happens is uh, the kidney does not actually take the actual exceptions of your body. Therefore, what they do is they give you several different medications to try to get it under control and get it functioning again. Oh, that must have been very, very frightening. That turned out okay, though, right? Yeah, uh, it was very frightening for me because my life was going to go back to what it used to be. Right. And so I was very terrified of that. And I understand that, that you didn't mention any of this to, uh, to your sister or your mom. Why was that? No, I did not because I didn't want them to worry or, or fear anything. And it was kind of like a personal thing for me because I wanted to get through it by myself. Of course, I understand. And, and Mom, how about you? How did you feel about that when you found out what had been happening? Well, I was terrified, actually, and, and kind of upset with him because he didn't share it with anybody. But that's Derek. That's Derek's way of doing things. He doesn't share too much. Well, he's a tough guy. He's been through yeah. a tough thing, and you're, yeah. a, you're a wonderful bunch. I'm sure you're all relieved everything worked out for everybody. Yes, we are. Well, yes. I'll tell you something, Derek. You continue to be living proof mm -hmm. that miracles can and do happen. And yes, Derek they and, do. Yes, they do. Thank you for sharing your story with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you. Stay with us for more incredible True Life Miracles right after this. Coming up, crushed beneath a thousand pounds of hay and struggling to stay alive, a man turns to prayer. God help me. Without a question, I knew I was dying at that point. I just said, God, I'm in your hands and his prayer is heard by a young girl. 
miles away. There's not words that can explain it. It was God telling me that something was wrong. Then, Donna McDonough was eight and a half months pregnant when she went into a premature labor. I went from having mild contractions to horrible, horrible, horrible contractions. But before she could get to the hospital, she began delivery. She's coming out, she's coming out. Pull over, she's coming out. Something just came over me that this baby was not alive, and I didn't know how we were going to deal with it. But an angel was on the way. Oh, These stories and more as It's a Miracle continues. It's amazing how quickly a simple decision can turn into a life-threatening situation. Take the wrong turn, touch the wrong wire, talk to the wrong person, and you can end up in serious trouble. That's what happened to the man in our next story. He made a simple decision that left him fighting for his life and losing. Yes, our man survives, but how he survives is nothing less than miraculous. For more than 20 years, Dick Lebsock of Visalia, California, has had a love affair with scale model replicas. I'm a builder. I like to take a pile of nothing and end up with something. It takes time and patience. Today, Dick focuses his hobby on cars and airplanes. But there was a time when boats were his favorite pastime. His prized possession, a nearly perfect hydroplane. His wife, Ellen, remembers. It was a very special boat. It takes maybe as many as 100 hours. By the time it's all painted, sanded, the radio control stuff is mounted in it. But it would be the last boat her husband ever built. For 20 years ago, on its maiden voyage, something terrifying happened. Terrifying and miraculous. It began on a cold afternoon in October 1979. Dick and his wife were meeting a friend to test the hydroplane on a pond not far from their home. We were really excited about this. We run the engine. We knew that that was going to work. We knew that the electronics were going to be all right. But we never really knew what it would do on the water. The pond was perfect for racing their boats. No wake, calm water. But from the beginning, something was wrong. It was a little reluctant to take off at first. We set it on the water, it would immediately die. Perhaps that was an idea that we should have paid more attention to at the time, but we were so excited that we just kept right on going. Dick overlooked the brief mechanical problem, and the two men began racing their boats. It was going across the lake from us. It looked like it was not a miniature toy. It looked like you were a long ways away from a real hydroplane. And you're not keeping up, you're not keeping up. After the two men had cruised their boats around the pond for a while, Dick's friend brought his ashore so that Dick could have the water to himself. Oh, it's great. I could hardly wait to open it up and see what it would actually do. He got the hydroplane in position for the longest run across the pond, pulled the throttle, gave it the power, and... It just died. It just stopped dead in its tracks. This is not something that is good. What's going on? The question now was how to retrieve it from its position in the water. This was a new boat. What's going on with so I decided that rather than to leave it out there, I would go get it. I didn't know how deep was deep in this pond. I figured that I could get to the boat, pull it back in, walk back out the same way that I came in. So I started in to the water and it just kept getting deeper and deeper. So where I'm watching, he's walking, suddenly he's gone. He just stepped off into this channel and went in over his head just that quick. I fought my way back up to the surface and took one more shot at where the boat was at. But a combination of the deep water and the heavy clothing he was wearing was dragging him down. By that time, I realized he was in real trouble. And it was kind of, why aren't they coming to get me? Don't they realize that something's wrong here? 
But neither Ellen nor their friend knew how to swim. And we were standing there watching him drown. There's really no way to describe how helpless and terrifying it is to stand there and watch somebody that you love dearly in that kind of danger. Dick continued to fight his way to the surface, but he couldn't seem to get another full breath. I guess I resigned myself at that moment. There wasn't anything I could do. I didn't have the power, I didn't have the strength to overcome the weight of my clothes, the coldness of the water. And so he began to slowly sink to his death. It was terrifying. I don't remember anything except extreme panic because I knew he was drowning and going, oh, please. And as if on cue, help arrived. I looked up and there was this young man in cutoff Levi's and he jumped into the water and he swam to where Dick was struggling in the water. All I know is that all of a sudden, instead of going down, I was now going up. Instead of being face first in the water, I was forcibly flipped over onto my back and I was being towed to shore. He grabbed him lifeguard style and swam, must have been a block, over to where we were. <coughs> Honey? Dick. Honey, are you all, I'm right? all right? I'm all right. Someplace in there, it occurred to me that this young man who had saved him didn't have on anything except a pair of cutoff Levi's, and it was cold. While Ellen ran to fetch a blanket, Dick's friend helped him to his feet. But when Ellen returned, the young man was nowhere to be seen. We looked around, and he was gone. There wasn't anybody anywhere. It was just that quick. There weren't any kids playing. There wasn't anybody riding around. There was nothing. There were the three of us. Who was this young man? Where had he come from? And where had he gone? Dick and Ellen are certain that he was an angel sent down to save Dick's life. I was going down one more time. I had no hope of getting to shore. For him to all of a sudden be there, hit the water, drag me out, you can't be touched like that and write it off as mere coincidence. And there's one more reason why they believe that the boy who saved Dick's life that day may not have been from this earth. It's so strange. He's gone. And we probably wouldn't have thought anything about it, except that when we got ready to go home, Dick's boat was laying on the ground in his feet. When I looked down and saw that boat, it was as much of a surprise as me even being there, much less being brought out of the water by somebody that wasn't there. Why would anyone, any human being, bother with the boat in the same instant that they were saving a life? This kid did. This angel did. Because that's the only thing it could have been. And nobody can convince me otherwise. You don't have to believe in angels to appreciate the miracle that happened to Dick Lebsock that day. But even if that young man wasn't sent from above, I still think he fits just about anyone's definition of an angel. We'll be right back. Coming up. Come on, honey. A young couple heading for the hospital are forced to make an unexpected stop. I said, she's coming out, she's coming out. Pull over, she's coming out. But it's not the only unexpected thing that will happen to them that day. And next, while moving a large bale of hay, Bob Peterson lost control of his tractor and was left crushed beneath a thousand pounds of hay and struggling to stay alive. A man turns to prayer and his prayer is heard by a young girl miles away. There's not words that can explain it. It was God telling me that something was wrong. As It's a Miracle continues. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. Welcome back. 
Our next story came to us through our recent campaign, America's Search for Miracles. Kathy Bennett of Holt, Michigan, sent us a letter about the miraculous chain of events that helped save her father's life. And she followed up her letter with a 23-page description of what happened that day. All I can add is this. If you've even wondered whether prayers are answered, there's one man who believes he wouldn't be alive today if that weren't true. Just outside Holt, Michigan, 66-year-old Bob Peterson shares a home with his wife, Agnes, their daughter, Kathy Bennett, and her children, Christy and Rob. Bob operates a small horse farm on his 60-acre ranch. It's a hobby. My family loves them, and I think the least I can do is provide a place for them to have them. In the colder months of the year, Bob feeds his horses using giant hay bales. We put them out into the pasture and we have the horses and they can go to them and they can eat when they want. The bales are five feet in diameter and five feet long and they weigh about 1,250 pounds. And you have to have heavy equipment to move them around. That's what Bob was doing late on the afternoon of March 17, 1998, when he ran into a problem on a stretch of muddy road. When it's slippery, you raise the bucket just a little bit, and it throws a little more weight on the back tires. It gives you a little more traction. It also blocked his view of a large stone lying in the road. The tractor was thrown off course, and as Bob struggled to control it, he pushed against the hydraulic lift control. The bucket shot up to its maximum height of 13 feet. The bale broke loose. They came down on me just like a chunk of cement. Absolutely no give, nothing, and I was just totally smashed under this bale of hay. Despite the accident, the tractor continued moving up the hill. In tremendous pain, Bob couldn't steer or see where he was going. I knew I had to somehow stop that tractor from continuing up the hill because it could easily tip over. Frantically dug through the hay to um, try to reach the key to shut it off. Finally, the tractor ground to a halt. As Bob struggled to peer around the edge of the bale, he saw that the disaster wasn't over yet. The forks broke loose somehow, and they were coming down on me, and that's all I remember. When Bob regained consciousness, he was in the mud beside the tractor. He could barely move. His ribs were crushed. A lung was punctured. Five vertebrae were fractured. His heart was damaged. I found myself just laying on my back on the road, and at that time, I was just in total 100% pain. I knew I had to do something or just die. Oh. God, Ever helping. so slowly, Bob began struggling toward his home, 400 feet away. So I kept dragging my body up this hill a little bit at a time, maybe three, four inches at one time, and then maybe six inches at the other time, and maybe just a couple inches the next time. Oh. God help me. My arms were so sore I couldn't even feel them. You know, they were just past pain. I just couldn't quit. You had to do it, hurt or no hurt. You know, I just had to keep dragging. After struggling for over half an hour, Bob realized he would never make it alone. But no help had come, and no one had seen me. And every move was causing unbearable pain. Bob Peterson was dying. Only a miracle could save him now. In March of 1998, Bob Peterson was moving a giant bale of hay from the fields to his barn when disaster struck. 
A large stone in the road threw his tractor off course, and moments later, the bale came crashing down on top of him. Bob managed to stop the moving vehicle, only to see the forklift's steel arms falling toward him. Now, with a punctured lung, crushed ribs and vertebrae, Bob desperately tried to crawl for help. But after over an hour, he'd only managed to cover 150 feet of ground. Without a question, I knew I was dying at that point. I just said, God, I'm in your hands. And then I blacked out. Bob's closest neighbors, the Rust family, lived 200 yards away. And at the same time Bob was praying for help, Emily Rust, the family's teenage daughter, was at a high school soccer practice. Suddenly, she was overwhelmed by a strange feeling. I can't really describe it. There's not words that can explain it. It was God telling me that something was wrong with Mr. Pete. Somehow Emily had sensed that Bob Peterson was in trouble and it stopped her dead in her tracks. I couldn't move. It was like I was trapped almost and I just said a prayer in my head. And I was so focused and overwhelmed in prayer that I didn't watch the ball and I got hit with the ball. As if in a chain reaction, Emily's 13-year-old brother, Joe, chose that exact moment to call Bob's grandson, Rob Bennett. Hello? Hi, Rob. Hey, what's up? Want to come and play video games with me? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll be right over. As Rob headed down the driveway, something caused him to pause. I heard this odd noise. It's a noise I've never heard before in my life. Bob's wife, Agnes, was watching from a window. All of a sudden, he stopped and uh, looked like he had heard something. And he ran back towards the barn. From more than 300 feet away, Rob had heard his grandfather's whispered plea for help. When I saw him laying there, I felt very scared that he was going to die. Rob immediately ran to get his mother, Kathy Bennett. His face was gray. His lips were blue. His eye was just an orb of red. I, at first, I thought his eye was gone because it was just so red and covered in blood. His voice was very weak and raspy, and he said, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to be in the ambulance with you, OK? Bob was rushed to a nearby hospital, where the emergency staff were amazed that he was even alive. The doctor said that if I wasn't found within 30 to 40 minutes, I'd have been gone, I'd have died. Because of the seriousness of his injuries, it was estimated that Bob would be hospitalized for six months and in physical therapy for a year. But two weeks later, Bob was home, walking on his own. My recovery was absolutely miraculous. I just did extremely, extremely well. When you think about the fact that he was crushed from front to back, that a person can come out of that two weeks later almost pain-free is amazing. Bob's survival depended on a series of remarkable oh, events, starting with his own prayer oh. for help just prior to blacking out. God help me. God help me. Could that prayer have been heard by a young girl several miles away? I knew that the only way I could help him was pray for him because the power of prayer is so strong. And could her prayer have been answered by her okay, younger brother, who contacted Bob's grandson, setting him on a course to find his dying grandfather? I can't explain how I heard him, because when I got up there, he was just whispering real quietly. They say that even a whispered prayer can be heard and answered. And Bob Peterson's family believes that this is true. I'm not sure how prayer works, if it's guardian angels, but there's a power there. I think there's power in prayer. I really feel that the power of prayer pulled me out. No question about it. The 
birth of a child is always miraculous, but sometimes the miracle is greater than anyone could have expected. Our next story is a perfect example. It takes place not in a hospital, but in a car on the side of a road. It involves medical complications that only trained personnel are capable of handling, and it gives new meaning to the phrase, the birth of a child is a blessed event. In February of 1999, Donna Fasciola McDonough was seven months pregnant when suddenly she went into premature labor. I went from having mild contractions to horrible, horrible, horrible contractions. Come on, honey. It went from zero to ten and skipped everything in between. Hurry, honey, hurry. Luckily, Donna's husband Michael was home that day to drive her to the hospital 20 minutes away. But once on the road, they became trapped behind a slow-moving vehicle, and Donna's contractions were getting even stronger. All of a sudden, I started screaming. I said, she's coming out, she's coming out. Pull over, she's coming out. And then I said, call 911. The first miracle of that day was about to happen. I never carry my cell phone. If I'm not working, I don't have it. I don't even remember grabbing it to walk out the door, but it was there. Michael contacted the emergency operator and gave her their position. An ambulance would be dispatched immediately, but it would take precious minutes before it could arrive. I'm coming, baby, I'm coming. At the same time that morning, paramedic George Ware had stopped on his way to work to take a short cat nap. I've done that maybe three times in all the years I've traveled the highway back and forth. For some reason, there was this car horn honking and woke me up. And I'm like, well, I better get on down the highway so I'm not late. Unit 16, proceed to 34. Moments later, George heard the ambulance dispatch call. And at the same time, noticed a minivan, fitting the description, pulled over to the side of the road. So I thought I'd pull over and offer any assistance I may be able to help with until the ambulance arrived. Certainly not expecting to find her in active delivery. George had arrived just in time. Donna was having a breech birth. Look, it is coming now! I just remember hearing him say, oh dear God, and out came one of her legs. I think it was two pushes. She was hanging by her neck, and then everything stopped. Oh, God. And at that time, all contractions ceased. She uh, just didn't have any more. And he was just holding her little body. And you know, you, without a contraction, a push is a joke. He kept saying, come on, we got to get the head out. I'm, I'm really going to need you to push. I asked her to try to push. Nothing resulted. At that time, I realized that this was a serious situation. He had 90% of her body out but her head. I had noticed that she was not moving. There was nothing happening, that she was beginning to turn blue. And George was starting to sweat a little bit. With the baby's head still trapped inside, there was an extreme danger of asphyxiation, as well as cutting off the blood supply to the umbilical cord. So to relieve that, I had to place two fingers inside uh, in the form of a V to help make an airway in case the baby had started to breathe. The baby was starting to turn bluer uh, and was basically uh, starting to get limp. I didn't know what it was, but I just knew that something was very, very wrong. I could see it when I looked at George. And at that point, I just prayed to God to, to just let her be okay. Donna's obstetrician, Dr. Paul Tutter, had been notified of the crisis and was rushing to the hospital, expecting to meet the ambulance there. Traditionally, in the worst scenario, if there is head entrapment, often there's cord compression. And when the cord is compressed, there's about a four minute window. Um, after that four minute window, um, there are horrific consequences to the baby. 
Nearly 10 minutes had already passed, and there was still no sign of an ambulance. Something just came over me that this baby was not alive, and I didn't know how we were going to deal with it. Several agonizing minutes later, the ambulance finally arrived, and paramedic Andrew Ramuzzi rushed to offer assistance. We've got an emergency situation. It was very obvious that we had to get the baby out very quickly, otherwise we were going to have, have a dead baby on our hands. It's all of a sudden there was this long lost contraction that I think just came from heaven. With me holding the head and George holding the back and, and the bottom, uh, we rotated and turned and the baby came right out. <laughs> she just started breathing and crying and was fine and everybody was shocked. I think we all just knew that um, because George was holding her, he was holding her little body and it went, it went limp, it turned blue and it died. I mean, the little body that she was in died. And I realized that, that you know, that's when he, I, God just came and took, he just came and took her. He just came and took her and he sent her back when everything was okay. When the ambulance pulled up to the hospital, to the emergency room, Dr. Tutter came rushing in. And because I still was kind of expecting the worst, I just became so emotional when that baby came out and that baby was perfectly normal and healthy and pink. And it's a moment that I'll remember for the rest of my life. You guys did a great job. How'd you pick that name for her? Dr. Tutter said, Donna, that little baby is a miracle of God, and she's just fine. There's not anything wrong with her. You don't have to worry about a thing. 14 weeks later, Donna and Michael's baby was baptized Mackenzie Maria. Mackenzie Maria, I baptized. And George Ware was honored in the ceremony as her godfather. George is incredible. I think that we all have guardian angels. Most of us aren't lucky to ever know them. I believe that as much as he's Mackenzie's, that he's mine. Unit 16, proceed to 3400 blocks. A guardian angel. What else could explain the unexpected delay that would place George in exactly the right place at the right time to take control of a situation that could have meant certain death for this child? Today, holding his goddaughter safe in his arms, George is very aware of the miraculous events that led to her birth. This has been the highlight of my career. It was truly God's work, and I just happened to be his tools to do that. It was definitely a miracle. We'll be right back. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night.